So let's jump ahead to the younger days now with these basalt lava flows. I don't know if you've heard this before. Some of you have come to many of these lectures and you've heard this loads of times. But most of you are unfamiliar to me and maybe therefore unfamiliar to this story. One of the reasons my friends know Ellensburg, they've never been here, but they know about eastern Washington because there's an unusual amount of basalt lava flow rock, which is normally found in the oceans of the world. But we have it in spades here in central Washington. And the oil people were in eastern Washington back in the 70s and 80s, Shell Oil, and they were back again recently looking for oil and natural gas below the basalts. And we know from their drilling that these basalt flows are more than 10,000 feet thick. 10,000 feet. More than two miles of basalt before you get to the swak formation down below. So the oil guys have left. They ran out of interest because it was not economical for them to get down. They still think there's plenty of natural gas way down below us, uh, but they know the business better than us, and they, they decided it wasn't worth their time. But this is the area, including Ellensburg here in the blue circle, that is dominated by these lava flows, which actually came out of the ground way over here by Hell's Canyon. So these lavas have nothing to do with Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens. It's actually the wrong kind of lava. Next one, Rock. Doing a good job, by the way. So that's all general stuff. Can we plug it into the valley? Sure, let's give it a try. So here's some Google Maps. Here's Ellensburg, uh, Kittitas. And let's head out on the old Vantage Highway, starting to climb up towards the wind turbines. Okay? Next one, please. So you recognize that? Maybe driven by that a bunch? Features. This is how the Earth is operating today to form those things. Next one, please. And here we have them in a 15 million year old basalt lava flow. So I'm not saying that there was deep ocean here at the time, but we definitely had to have water here, probably a temporary lake, occupying central Washington to explain these kinds of features. And then, of course, we've labeled each of these guys with names like Vantage Sandstone and Kelly Hollow Lava Flow. Next one, please. Okay, so we were right here on the old Vantage Road. Let's go to another place that might look similar to you, but actually is quite different. Uh, let's go up. Uh, this is the freeway crossing the Nashtash. You're all local, so maybe you've never stopped at the viewpoint. That's for tourists, right? To actually pull off the freeway and, and stop and look. Um, but we go up there all the time for geology teaching. Let's take a look up there. Next one, please. So this is in the wintertime. But we've got another sandstone with a lava flow above and a lava flow below. And these lava flows are very, very thick, by the way. We're just looking at the very basal portion, probably the lower tenth of this lava flow. The rest has been eroded away. And here's just the upper, I don't know, eighth of this next lava flow. But this, which looks like just the same picture we saw before, is a different sandstone at a higher level in this incredible stack of lava flows and sandstones. Next one, please. So we've labeled these as well. They have different names. Kelly Hollow. That was Kelly Hollow before, right? So now we're at the top of the Kelly Hollow lava flow. Something called the Squaw Creek Interbed. I guess we don't use that name anymore. And Rosa Lava Flow. Next one, please. So there's an old-time geology professor who spent much of his career at Central. His name is Bob Bentley. You might remember him. If you ever met him, you will remember him. He's a very uh, dominant personality, shall we say. He's living in Baja, California now, but he taught me the ropes with Central Washington, and he knows these bedrock layers better than anybody. And what he did eventually was hand draw some sketches about our area at different times in the past. So this is one of Bentley's sketches roughly 15 million years ago, and let me try, help you try to understand it. Based on that sandstone we just saw, during the time when that sandstone was being formed up on Menashtash, Bentley's imagining a sluggish river system coming from the northwest, kind of like the present day Yakima, and building into a delta system, entering into a temporary lake that was in front of an advancing basalt lava flow. In other words, he's got a whole picture in his mind, a whole snapshot in his mind of what this place was like 15 million years ago, long before the valley was formed, long before the ridges were, it was flat 15 million years ago, humid, 
advancing lava like in Hawaii. Can you see how we get drawn into this topic? It's, you all like history. You're in a history museum. This is history. It's just a different... It's history on steroids, right? We're going back millions of years instead of 100 years or 150 years. I love human history as much as the next guy. I love local history here in the valley, the architecture and everything else. This is the same thing, just going back a little further, that's all. Next one, please. Oh, uh, let's keep going. <laughs> so, I was confused when I first came to town talking about bedrock because people kept talking about shale rock. And here's out uh, east of Kittitas and Shale Pit Road. I couldn't get it because there wasn't any shale in the bedrock locally here. People kept talking about shale. Well, it turns out I realized that what is called shale by many of you folks, perhaps, uh, you know, by shale rock and look in the classifieds, that's lava rock. That, that's, that's the interior portion of these lava flows that break into these natural plates. And to, to most of us in geology, shale is mud that forms at the bottom of a lake. Nothing here like that. This is, this is the shale rock. So next one, please. This is where the shale, quote unquote shale, is coming from in the middle of these basalt lava flows that we find throughout the bedrock. Ah, just a technicality. Next one, please. Uh, yeah, I don't remember why we put that map in again, so let's continue. Right, okay, we'll never know. Um, let's take those flat layers now, which means our terrain is flat. What's this? This is the geology of Kittitas Valley. That's the title of the talk. We don't have a valley yet. We don't have ridges yet. It's Nebraska right now. It's flat. So we now have to take those layers and fold them to get them into the familiar system of ridges that we know now. Next one, please. So, yo, there we go. Here's Menashtash. We're down at Thrall, right? And here's the freeway heading up to that viewpoint. So how did that ridge form? And how long has it been there? Well, so far we can say this ridge it formed younger than 15 million years. What's our evidence? Well, our lava flow layers are 15, and they had to be flat when they formed. They crossed the state, it turns out. So these ridges have not always been there. Maybe that's newest to you. Ridges, mountains, lakes, rivers, they all have a lifespan. But they haven't always been exactly the way that they are today. And that's what geology teaches us. So, Sometime in the last 15 million years, those ridges formed. Why? Next one, Rock. Oh, another shot. We're up hiking out to the book on Menashtash near the canyon. We're looking north. Here's Ellensburg and Mount Stewart. Next one, please. So here's Jack Powell again giving us a very simple animation. Here's our layers of bedrock, mainly the Columbia River basalt flows. And let's make some ridges. Next one, please. To do that, we need to squeeze the layers, put them in a vise, and start to compress. And if the conditions are right, we're going to warp them into upfolds and downfolds. Next one, please. It really is as simple as that. So here again is Table Mountain, where the rock layers are pretty near flat, slightly tilting, but pretty, pretty flat. But let's go someplace else. Thanks. Next one. Uh, in fact, let's go. Let's see, what is, where is north here? So Ellensburg is off to the left. Here's the freeway heading up. Here's the rest stop at the top of Menashtash. We're, head, we're driving to Yakima. We're going to Costco. Okay? <laughs> we're going on the road here. And here, you know what this is. This is the Yakima River Canyon, right? And superimposed on that is the Menashtash and North Untanum Ridge. And there's a third one, right? There's three ridges between Ellensburg and Yakima if you take the freeway. Let's continue, Rocky. So Powell says to do that, we need to squeeze these layers to get them to warp into these ridges. Next one, please. So he's continuing to add geologic symbols now to show us the trend of these folds. So the layers warp down. It's called a syncline, actually. They warp up, they warp down, they warp up. But it's all part of the same system. Next one, please. I'm probably blocking you. Let's, 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 let's switch for a sec. I can use my other arm. <laughs> uh, so here's a map. Ellensburg to Sela. Here's the freeway. Here's the canyon. And here's our set of folds that we
we now talk about forming in the last 15 million years. Notice they're not perfectly east-west. They have a northwest-southeast trend to them. There's a reason for that. Next one, please. The reason for that, and this might really blow your mind, but what the heck. <laughs> we have instruments now permanently anchored in the bedrock all throughout the Pacific Northwest. This is Washington, Oregon, and California. And it's GPS. You have GPS in your cars maybe or something. I don't, but maybe you do. But there's GPS that we use to detect very tiny motions within the North American plate. It's moving. And that network has told us that we have a slow but sure clockwise rotation of the crust in the Pacific Northwest. I'm talking about millimeters of motion per year. Millimeters, like this. Tiny. But every year, a little bit of motion. But because of this motion of, the, of the, these plate tectonic uh, arrangements. So we have this motion. Now what was I working on? Why are our ridges northwest, southeast? Do you see the answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our ridges are in here like this. The reason the ridges are like that is because California, northern California and southern Oregon, is being rotated into us. California. Not people coming to our valley now, but the actually California coming to our valley, all right? And squeezing us and rippling our crust. If we didn't have this rotation, we wouldn't have those ridges. Next one, please. Now here's a really interesting image to show that. It might take a while to get acclimated. The yellow are cities. So here's Seattle, Portland, Tri-Cities, Yakima, Ellensburg. Can you kind of see it? And can you see our ridges here? Horse Heaven Hills, Toppenish Ridge, etc. Here we go. Here's our rotating block. All these ridges are crumpling up as California is rotating around that pivot point. Next one, please. And if you look very carefully, places like Baldy Mountain, which is two-thirds of the way towards Yakima, uh, the layers are, are no longer flat, but completely wrapped around. They're completely deformed. So it's not just simple upfold. Sometimes you're faulting, you're cracking the crust, you're warping them. It's a complicated situation. But the point is, our ridges and our valleys are from this warping or this deformation. Next one, please. Okay, let's keep rolling. And then again, I'm, I'm hoping to get some questions and answers going here. Let's fill the valley with loose rock called the Ellensburg Formation. Next one, please. Uh, what does this look like? Well, let's go out Route 10 towards Kaliella. Okay, Ellensburg down here. Let's go out Route 10. We're by the we're by the freeway. Excuse me. We're by the river, and we're going to go to this dot right here. Next one, please. Can I ring a bell? White rock, white bluffs out on the river on the old road to Cleola. Great. I've heard plenty of people talk about that white rock as the old sandstone out there. Let's go, let's drive by. Where'd you see a deer this morning? I saw a deer out by the white sandstone out by shore. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, it's not sandstone, it turns out. It's got a more interesting uh, history. Next one, please. So as we stop and look at this big cut, you've all seen it. Looks like sandstone. Looks like the sandstone pictures I showed just a few minutes ago. But if you really look carefully, next one, there are some brilliant white rocks and some rounded river rocks. And if you take any of this white rock out, if you take the time to take those rocks and break them with a hammer, that's what we do, <coughs> this rock is very fragile, very soft. And if it's a sunny day, it's very sparkly. There's lots of crystals in it. This white stuff is pumice, which forms in a fragile throat of a volcano. And this pumice would never survive sandstone deposition, which is rolling sand grains around in a desert floor or in a river system. So this has a volcanic history, so what the heck is it? Next one, please. 